What's up, Mountie and students? <clears throat> Talking about the culture of the 60s, dude. Peace, love, hippie, bro. Yeah, that's what we're doing today. We're going to talk a little bit about that, some other kind of protest movements that happened across the 60s, just so we can wrap this decade up and then move on to the 70s for our next lesson. All right, so let's just get into it. So the 60s can really be defined as a counterculture movement. <clears throat> The 60s was just a radical departure from what was around in the 50s. People began questioning authority, questioning gender roles, societal norms, at least here in the United States. So the 60s was a huge shift away from the status quo of the nuclear family and things like that. People began experimenting with drugs. We'll talk about that. Sexual revolution. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and this time period is just known as like, we call this like the beginning of the counterculture movement, because it was a culture that was so counter to everything that Americans were used to. Hippies, bro. Hippies. Kind of notice the fashion, the style, gone were the, you know, shaved faces for the dudes and the slick back hair and whatnot in the short sleeve put together dresses right for the for the uh ladies but 60s fashion was all about bunch of color bunch of just random stuff tie-dye jewelry long hair rugged look just throw on what you got as you can kind of tell there right all about peace and love bro and colors music rock and roll was still big but rock had really kind of moved on from the days of Elvis. The Beatles were, and arguably are, the most popular band in the world, right? And you had other artists like the Rolling Stones, the Who, Jimi Hendrix. They were very popular at the time. But that type of rock and roll, um, which if you listen to that or pop it on, different than the 50s rock and roll and the Elvis rock and roll. That you got a picture of the Beatles. Paul McCartney is the dude in the blue. Um, he's the only one that is left alive. Got the Rolling Stones, the Who there. A lot of British uh, uh, influence. A lot of British rock and roll people got pretty big in the 60s. More talking about music. Uh, one of the biggest events of the 60s was in the summer of 69. This event known as Woodstock, which started out as kind of just this idea of, hey, let's have a bunch of artists come together and then invite people and we'll call it a music festival. Um, and Woodstock would really come to symbolize the 60s. Um, over 400,000 people showed up for the festival, um, way more than what was expected. And, you know, a lot of drug and sexual experimentation was rampant at the, uh, the festival. Um, I mean, this just gives you an idea of the crowds, right? I mean, just huge amounts, like, all across here. People just showing up, right, in the mud, sleeping out. Woodstock is kind of the ancestral, I don't know, relative to what Coachella is, right? There is no Coachella or Outside Lands or other music festivals you will all go to when you're in college um, without Woodstock. And so Woodstock kind of changed the way we partake in music, right? The 60s were also a time period of a lot of protesting. So when you compound that there was the civil rights movement going on and really anti-Vietnam War sentiments combined together, the 60s were a time period of really low levels of patriotism, big questions against the government, anti-government kind of mood, and a lot of civil disobedience. Most of the civil, uh, most of the protesting was done by either uh, usually across the board young people and then people of color who were more agitated about the civil rights movement, right? Again, this contributed to the counterculture movement of the 60s. Just showing you just the protesting. This one on the bottom right here is actually at UC Berkeley. Um, Berkeley in the Bay Area. Um, were a center and really a, a bastion for progressive ideals. That's why the Bay Area today is the most progressive place in the world. A lot of people moved out here in the 60s because the Bay Area represented uh, more of a progressive lifestyle, forward thinking, 
less like old timey values. And so that's why the Bay area today, the legacy of that is like the legacy of the sixties and of the hippie movement, those people who had kids, right. And how they raised their kids and then so on and so forth. Right. Um, yeah. Bay area. <clears throat> Talking more about the drugs and sexual revolution. The sixties was also a time where just people began experimenting with drugs very much more openly. Um, drugs like acid, mushrooms, marijuana became much more mainstream. Um, sexual freedom was more celebrated, especially, you know, when we talk about like LGBTQ plus and kind of uh, their visibility in the American spectrum and being out there, um, you know, talking about, you know, how, how women were allowed to be more open, right, with their sexuality before it was just like, you know, you were the mom, you just took care of the kids that you don't do anything else, right. But again, right, this, you know, a part of the 60s was also growth in like feminism and women's rights, which in part is kind of tied into the sexual revolution. And again, places like the West Coast were were the hotbed, a welcoming place for more pro progressive ideals and people. A lot of these people were referred to as hippies because they were hip, which I guess is kind of a cool term because if you weren't a hippie in the 60s, that means you were probably an old timey mean person. Um, so yeah, a little bit about that. A pretty, 1969, by the way, is a very seminal, huge year. Um, you'll see why in the homework assignment. But uh, the Stonewall riots, this is very important. This is a landmark event for LGBTQ plus movement around the world. Um, huge uh, movement uh, or moment, excuse me, in, in, in their history. Um, so this, this is all about a confrontation that occurred between the New York Police Department and a lot of members of the LGBTQ plus group. Um, and it was at this uh, gay bar called the Stonewall Inn in New York City. Um, and at this time, America was very anti-LGBTQ+, right? And the NYPD uh, was looking for a lot of petty reasons to arrest and go after these people and mostly just pester these people, right? Because they didn't fit into the nuclear family model and they were just some hippies and they were, you know, subhuman. I mean, just you could the hatred, right, and the bigotry that existed. Um, but violence broke out in response to the raid of the bar. The people in the bar were like, no, you're not going to press us like this. And so they fought back throwing bricks and glasses, and it was a violent clash. Um, and so in the ensuing days, more protests and riots ran out across the city um, in response to kind of the unprovoked attack and raid on the bar. And Stonewall is considered the most important moment for improving LGBTQ rights and equality in our country um, because it opened America's eyes to, hey, there are people in this country who are a part of this group and are being oppressed. We are here, we are visible. Um, and so it was a really big moment um, um, for at least just awareness and visibility, right? Um, you know, Stonewall, uh, that event um, uh, it gave birth in the following year to the Pride festivals. And then Pride eventually became a nationwide thing, it usually happens in the summer, um, in correspondence right around when Stonewall happened. Um, and, you know, it's, a, you know, it's usually a big weekend festivals in cities. Um, San Francisco is one of the biggest ones, um, uh, San Francisco Pride. Um, it's just like, you know, again, raising awareness, promoting equality for people, part of the LGBTQ uh, plus groups, right? This is the Stonewall Inn. Again, not very huge, but it's a national monument today. It actually became a national monument a few years ago. Um, it's pretty cool. So, um, yeah. Yeah, just a little part of history there that should be recognized. We're going to wrap up talking about the farm workers movement, another part of the 60s, right, that in a way represents the counterculture movement. So for years here in California, Hispanic and also a lot of Filipino um, migrant workers came, came to the Central Valley to work on the farms. These farms provide over 80 percent of our country's food supply, right? Um, and farm workers for, for years and years and years, you know, even to today, really have dealt with bigotry, racism, you know, the whole, you're, you're an immigrant, go back home, they're, you know, you're 
ruining our country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in general, this kind of helped contribute to really poor working conditions and low wages for farm workers. Um, it was just, you know, it was hard for them to make a life here um, when they were doing such important work that needed to be done to help, I don't know, feed our country, 80% of it. Um, and this kind of gives, leads into like Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers kind of uh, movement. So you guys probably heard of Cesar Chavez, right? Uh, he was an activist who fought for the rights of farm workers, um, you know, across the United States, but primarily the focus is in the Central Valley, right? Because that's where the majority of farm workers are, it represents 80% of our food supply, right? So a lot of things are happening in the Central Valley. Um, <clears throat> he united farm workers across California and other parts of the country through the union known as the United Farm Workers, right? The famous saying is si se puede. Um, and, um, you know, what Chavez was fighting for was helping to organize and lead protests, marches, boycotts of products um, in order to improve the wages and working conditions for farm workers. So this includes great boycotts. You know, uh, Cesar Chavez was, was famous for going on food strikes, um, other marches across, you know, marching the, up the very hot Central Valley with other farm workers bringing awareness to the cause and, and the workers. And because of him and the UFW, uh, through their, you know, years of organizing protests, marches, et cetera, um, eventually farm worker conditions, wages, and overall quality of life improved. Um, so, you know, farm workers and all of us owe a great deal of gratitude to Cesar Chavez and, um, and the, uh, and the uh, UFW. Um, Cesar Chavez passed away in 93, um, but his legacy is definitely not forgotten. Um, and this just goes to show you kind of some of the protests, right? Don't buy California grapes. That was the big thing. Like the grape boycotts were really big. Um, <clears throat> yeah, even today, you know, the UFW is still a very big, powerful organization, right? The legacy of Chavez is still very real. We have middle schools named after him here. And here in California, we get the day off, right? He's a California icon. And if we ever had our own money, he should be on one of the, uh, like he could be on the California, like $1 bill or something like that. That's my vote. Um, and there's a lot of murals of him, right? Uh, you can find across California, especially. Um, I know when I was at UC San Diego, there's a really big mural of him, which is really cool. Um, this one is in San Francisco, I believe. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, y'all. That is all I have for you guys with this video. Uh, make sure you do the homework assignment and I will talk to you guys later. See ya.